So let's move on to glenohumeral arthritis, which of course is going to be a topic that will come up quite a bit. And, uh, and we'll start with a question to get you thinking about this. In comparison to patients with osteoarthritis, patients with inflammatory arthritis undergoing shoulder arthroplasty are more likely to have a large inferior humeral osteophyte. You know that's a big part of osteoarthritis. Medialization of the glenohumeral joint line, posterior humeral head subluxation, sclerotic glenoid, or posterior glenoid wear. And I think you can figure out the answer here medialization of the glenoid joint line, which can happen in patients with osteoarthritis. There's an A2 classification, which we'll cover later, where it goes more medially. But typically, a large inferior osteophyte, posterior humeral head subluxation, sclerotic glenoid, and posterior glenoid wear are typical of patients with osteoarthritis. And, um, and so that's what we're thinking about. Um, with regards to... Um, um, a degenerative joint disease, the, two, the main one that we treat, especially with shoulder arthroplasty, is uh, osteoarthritis, and then secondary rheumatoid arthritis. Just like uh, patients with elbow conditions, the medications that are used now for rheumatoid arthritis have been miraculous in terms of limiting the need to going on to joint arthroplasty. Even if the uh, architecture of the shoulder gets uh, changed because of their disease, many of them are comfortable and don't need to have a shoulder replacement, and oftentimes they present late. And when they do, their cuff is non-functional, and we end up having to do a reverse, as uh, Bill talked about that earlier. So um, uh, it's, uh, when you see the rheumatoid arthritis here, commonly associated with rotator cuff tears, especially as they go on through life, and it says 25 to 50 percent have full thickness tears when they actually present you with symptoms, especially with the medications that they have at this time. So you have to keep that in mind. You really have to evaluate the cuff on a rheumatoid patient, but for most of them, we lean towards a reverse because of that high predictability of cuff disease. Um, of course, it's more common in the elderly, but I don't know what the word elderly means anymore. Uh, the average age for a patient undergoing a shoulder arthroplasty for osteoarthritis is in the early 60s, about 62, 63. And so that's not really elderly in my mind. Um, uh, but of course, as they go through life in 70s and 80s, the incidence of arthritis will increase. Uh, primary osteoarthritis. Lots of thoughts about why that happens, um, and it's multifactorial, as you're well aware. Uh, rotator cuff tears with this condition are actually quite rare. They, they actually present about 10% of the time, but most of them are partial, and only about 5% of them are full thickness, and the vast majority of these are just in the supraspinatus area and are treated non-operatively. And, and even at the time of surgery, we generally don't make a big effort to try to repair them unless it's a nice flap to repair. But if it's chronic, degenerative, small supraspinatus tear, it doesn't matter whether you repair it or not. There's good evidence that it makes no difference in the outcome for your patients. If it's a larger cuff tear, then you have to start thinking about reverse and the indications for cuff tear disease and osteoarthritis. So keep that in mind. And then again, here's an example, as you see on the radiographs, uh, a very uh, frequent finding, uh, and that is that you have a glenoid here and the humeral head is sublux at least 50% posteriorly with posterior glenoid wear. And this is one of the more complex cases of osteoarthritis when we start to see this condition uh, developing. We have to think really hard about what to do for that. Um, we see uh, this condition of arthritis in our younger patients, and it can have a very diffuse list of potential etiologies. And one of them is trauma, and uh, another one is surgery. So surgery for instability is a big problem for our young people. And so here's an example of a previous surgery. This was a stabilization surgery. We know from that staple, most likely was an operation called the Magnuson stack, where they took and they stapled the subscapularis in a way that prevented external rotation, that prevented the shoulder from slipping out of place. It overconstrained the shoulder, so as this young person went through their life, every time they rotated it out in a lateral direction or uh, external rotation, they put this horrible force on the front of their shoulder and it pushed it out the back, and they go on to develop a condition which we call capsulorophy arthropathy, and it's a challenging condition. There are others, chondrolysis. I tell you, a decade ago, this was a big issue. Um, the, uh, there was a couple of very significant events that occurred, and uh, we ended up ha seeing a number of young people who had surgery for an instability problem that went on to lose the cartilage in their shoulder. It's a devastating disorder because it doesn't just affect the cartilage, it affects the capsule and everything else, and there's not really a, a great answer for this.
This is the classic uh, classification for glenoid deformity. It's the Walsh classification. Gilles Walsh is from Lyon, France, and probably one of the most famous shoulder surgeons in the world over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And so uh, type 1 is when it's a concentric. Uh, mild erosion. Type 2 is there's a little more deeper central erosion, but again, it's concentric, uh, which is important because this is a, the rotator cuff is balanced, and this should be, these should be relatively straightforward uh, conditions to treat. The B1s is when we start to see asymmetric wear, and we, got, we have subluxation of the humeral head. Early on, there's an early development of a biconcave glenoid, a very small one, and the subluxation, and then later, it becomes this B2. And this is just a really difficult problem for us. We haven't figured out the best answer. There's all sorts of solutions that are being offered at this time, uh, but we, we are struggling to really say that what are the perfect uh, treatment for this problem. And then the C is what's known as the dysplastic uh, type glenoid. There is a, a new uh, one, which I don't think you'll be tested on yet, but there's one that's called a B3, and that might be a little complex, but the idea is, is that it was a B2, and as it continues to progress over time, uh, this, this wears, again, more and more in the posterior corner, and it actually ends up looking as if it's not as subluxed as a B2, uh, but what happens is that's this the, what we call the paleoglenoid. The old glenoid is completely worn away, and this goes in this direction here. So they're retroverted. The head's a little bit more re, uh, reduced, and this is an, an advanced stage of the B2 glenoid. So, and that's the B3. That uh, uh, again, we're struggling with any of the Bs, but especially the B2s and the B3s. Um, and when we go over that. The C's are ones that we try very, very hard not to operate on, and many of these will have more than 30 degrees of retroversion, and oftentimes a hemiarthroplasty is the only reasonable option for them. Uh, glenohumeral arthritis, just like hip or knee, pain at night, flattening of the uh, shoulder contour due to posterior subluxation and decreased external rotation. The radiographs, as I mentioned, uh, AP, true AP is very valuable in an axillary lateral view, and then you can supplement that with additional views. Uh, this is the inferior osteophyte that you see here, very typical. Some people refer to it as the goat's beard. And then you want to be careful just to check where that humeral head is, how it registers with the glenoid. And if there's any superior migration, you have to be a little concerned uh, about the rotator cuff and how it's functioning. But with most patients with osteoarthritis, as you see here, it's generally fairly concentric with regards to the superior inferior height, uh, but it starts to wear out the back or in a more posterior direction. So um, this is what we see, uh, and we've been talking about those things. Uh, to, to really understand the bone the best, um, I think we all agree that a CT scan is valuable. If you really want to understand the, this architecture carefully, a 2D CT scan is good and very helpful, but a 3D CT scan is the best. And there's a lot of information that we all learn from that. So we recommend a 3D CT scan uh, for the best imaging uh, with regards to that. Um, and then if you're concerned that you can't understand, uh, our European colleagues use a CT arthrogram to look at both the bone and the rotator cuff tendon and muscle. And I can tell you most of us on the other side of the Atlantic are not that comfortable with that. So many of us will get a CT scan to look at the bony structures, but if we're concerned at all about the cuff, the quality of the muscle, then we'll go ahead and supplement that with an MRI, which may direct us more towards having a reverse instead of a total in patients who have a deficient rotator cuff. Anti-inflammatory uh, treatment is the first line of defense, as you're all well aware. 65-year-old man with chronic right shoulder pain and crepitation. Physical exam shows his strength is five out of five or equal to his opposite side. He has pain with passive and active motion. His radiographs A and B show that he has uh, what appears to be uh, a loss of his joint space. So let's go ahead and get that clicked on here. Okay. And uh, all right, my arrow is struggling a little bit. Here we go. So loss of joint space, loss of joint space with some posterior wear, typical of osteoarthritis. And so then when we go through this, we're comparing total shoulder versus hemi. Improved pain relief. Um, the hemi arthroplasty results in which of the following? Improved pain relief? No. Nope. Increased rate of revision surgery? Maybe. Increased blood loss? No, because you don't have to do the glenoid. Increased postoperative instability? Increased postoperative infection rate? 
and so increased rate of revision surgery. Uh, this, in some parts of the world, is a controversial subject. Uh, every uh, study that's tried to do a comparative study has shown that total shoulders uh, do work better long term, but there's a lot of surgeons that really like the results with hemiarthroplasty, but the literature strongly supports uh, when you do a comparative study level three or above that there is an increased rate of revision surgery and the most common reason is because they get pain from the arthritis on their glenoid side. And so we typically recommend total shoulder arthroplasty for osteoarthritis. Um, the indications, as you see here, are the typical ones, pain, inability to perform activities. Contraindications would be deltoid dysfunction, insufficient glenoid bone stock, as you see here. This almost looks like a Charcot joint, uh, so that's going to be a very difficult problem to manage. Uh, the outcomes uh, are, are good. Uh, the revision rate's less than HEMI long term. Survivorship is listed as around 90 to 90 5%, and most commonly survivorship is related to the longevity of the glenoid as the humeral component uh, stays is quite strong. In fact, the incidence of aseptic humeral loosening with the stem that's put in well at the beginning is about 1% uh, per year or less, so actually 1% to 2% in about 10 years. The glenoids are the ones that we have a problem with. Uh, there are some other treatments. Um, uh, people have talked about hemiarthroplasty with biological resurfacing uh, for young patients. So here is a device which is a resurfacing device, which looks nice here. Um, we are not fans of that in Chicago because we did not have the results that other people did around the world, uh, particularly down in the southern part of the United States. And I can tell you that a general overall feeling is that this is an okay uh, procedure, but a bit unpredictable in most surgeons' hands. Um, so, but there is some reports that it works in certain parts of the country. Reversal shoulder arthroplasty, and, and Bill went over this, but basically, uh, you know, this is a patient with cuff deficiency and arthritis, and beware if there's glenoid bone loss and deltoid deficiency. Those are the two major contraindications. Uh, fusions, we really don't do fusions anymore for osteoarthritis. We really don't do fusions anymore for instability. We certainly, there are times when you might be forced to do that, but it's not a very reliable or satisfying procedure for either the patient or the doctor. Fusions are best done for a neurologic deficit. So a patient that has a, a motorcycle accident, they lose the function of the brachial plexus, but their hand is still functioning, that's probably the best patient uh, for a, a fusion, which is done very rarely now. Arthroscopic debridement, um, uh, this, uh, you know, it's a temporizing measure. Uh, it's a, it, some people have reported some good success with that, uh, but again, we have an issue with regards to the value of this procedure. If you do an operation that only lasts two to four years and costs money, and interferes with potentially the result long term, uh, the value is not going to show up in quality of life. So we're trying to do operations that last a minimum of five and hopefully 10 to really show value. And that's where shoulder arthroplasty comes into play. So the glenohumeral arthritis question, an 80-year-old right-hand dominant male presents to a clinic with one month of left shoulder pain, has crepitance as well as a positive drop arm test on exam. So his something's wrong, he's weak. Um, radiographs are significant for glenohumeral arthritis, and MRI de demonstrates gutalier stage four, fatty infiltration of the rotator cuff. I don't know if it's the entire cuff or not, but stage four means there's really hardly any muscle left. Uh, which of the following is not an appropriate option? non and a cortisone injection, um, you could do that for conservative management. Arthroscopic rotator cuff repair, uh, even in the hands of the best, I think that would be challenging. Shoulder hemiarthroplasty, activity modification or physical therapy, and reverse shoulder arthroplasty. We, we know uh, which is the best option there. So arthroscopic cuff repair is not recommended. I personally would struggle a little bit with the idea of a shoulder hemiarthroplasty in 2017. I think the best answer by far, of course, is going to be a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty for an 80-year-old that has arthritis and a non-functioning rotator cuff. And so I, I think there's a, a very little question where you would go with, with that uh, answer today. The arthroscopic cuff repair, uh, a lot of people are pushing the limits with that. And again, we really have to look at some of the longer-term results. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.